Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, let me welcome you all to the ICS Wednesday seminar. In today's panel discussion, we'll be focusing on the modernization of the PLA Navy and the response of regional navies in the Indo-Pacific. To speak on the subject, we have with us today a panel of very distinguished speakers. We are joined by Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt, retired U.S. Naval officer and currently senior fellow at CNA Arlington. Ms. Darshana M. Borua, fellow with the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, New Delhi, and visiting fellow at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo. Dr. Colin Ko, Research Fellow at the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. And Captain Kamlesh Kumar Agnihotri, Retired Indian Naval Officer and currently Senior Fellow at the National Maritime Foundation. Chairing the session today is Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, ABSM and Bar VSM, retired from the Indian Navy and currently the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation. Before I invite the Chair to begin the proceedings, let me lay out the housekeeping rules. All participants except the speaker shall be muted for the duration of the event. Participants are requested to send in their queries via the chat box or use the raise hand option. Please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so by the chair. I will now invite the chair to begin the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me at the very outset uh, thank Ambassador Ashok Kanta and the uh, ICS for affording us all uh, this opportunity to interact and to engage one another on a subject that is of increasing uh, centrality, um, notwithstanding the uh, preoccupation of the world with events taking place in, uh, in Europe. So uh, I think that uh, in terms of the threats, uh, both these are insidious, both of them are invidious, and one of them is certainly uh, more pressing. I suppose that would be Russia and the Ukraine problem, but one of them is the far larger threat, and that is that of China. We could not have had a more uh, distinguished and erudite panel for today's talk. And it isn't me that you've come to hear, but them. And I have no intention of introducing them because that would be uh, completely redundant if each of them is an expert in his or her own right and uh, have straddled the world of strategy. And I'm privileged to have interacted with each one of them over the last several years. So I do have one or two short comments uh, before I uh, hand over the proceedings first to Admiral McDevitt, uh, and whom it is always a privilege uh, to listen to. And uh, he has, of course, as you are well aware, uh, acquired amazingly even more global renown than he already had uh, as a senior fellow at the CNA, having uh, authored this absolutely brilliant book on China as a 21st century naval power. Uh, and so uh, not, that's not to uh, detract in any way from the many accomplishments of the other panelists, but let me, let me ask you some uh, basic, uh, let me raise some basic issues and then we'll proceed from there. The first is this business of uh, you know, China and its naval modernization being part of a strategic plan uh, under President Xi Jinping to say that China is going to be the, uh, the prima Donna of the world in uh, 2049. Personally, I think that this is a serious strategic mistake because nations ought never to give a date by which they will do some grand thing or the other. Secondly, if a nation lays great store by the concept of face, which is quite different from the concept of, um, of um, honor or the concept of respect, Chinese and Japanese share this particular, and South Korea, I suppose, share this particular uh, facet of their personality, their psyche, which is face. And yet we do not have an adequate amount of uh, uh, academic support in uh, exploring the concept. But we definitely do generally agree that uh, face is a major aspect of the Chinese psyche. So nations that give great store by face or to face ought to be extraordinarily careful about this. Secondly, no, no Westphalian power uh, has actually become the global hegemon without simultaneously being the maritime hegemon. And if you've given yourself just till 2049 uh, to become this maritime, uh, this global hegemon, uh, I think that you're going to fall desperately short of being the global maritime hegemon, because it is not a function of whether China is or isn't, or the PLA Navy 
will or will not best that of the United States. That's not the question at all. The question is whether China will be in a position to better the maritime power, the combined maritime power of many of the nations of the world, for example, the nations constituting the Quad, but not limited to them, uh, India, the United States, Australia, Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, much of the European Union, the United Kingdom. Will this array be capable of being bested by China? Uh, I have very serious doubts. And if not, then what? For example, at one point in time in India, a erstwhile president of India said, published a book which said that India superpower in 2020. So 2020 came along in 2020 went and India didn't become a superpower. But that didn't matter. In India, we have this great ability to, uh, you know, uh, self-deprecate and laugh at ourselves. And we said, OK, 2020, no problem. We try for 3020. But in the case of China, this is hardly likely to be the case, simply because in China, the concept of the interest of the people of China has been conflated with the concept of the face of the Chinese Communist Party. And if the face of the Chinese Communist Party was not bad enough, that has got conflated to the face of Xi Jinping. And that is a very serious mistake for the second count. And the second count of strategic error here is that you should uh, generally maintain somebody. It's not always right, important to be right or wrong, but it's always important to have somebody to blame. And if you've knocked off everybody who you could have blamed, then that leaves just you. The third is that as time goes by, like every other nation preparing for something grand and great, or every other human being preparing for an examination, as the years go by and we are finding them going by in a blur and a whiz, then China will start to make mistakes, like anybody would, as your preparation runs short of the time that you have at your disposal. So now the trick is for all of us to recognize what constitutes a mistake early enough for us to then do something about it. Why do we want to do anything about all of this? This allows us, this forces us into an appreciation of what is it that we actually are seeking to do. What we are seeking to do, I think, personally, and I, I'm open to criticism on the subject, is really to... Um, is really to make sure that we do not end up in a Sinocentric world order in which the rules of that order are determined solely by one nation acting arbitrarily, as opposed to the na nations of the world having painstakingly hammered out a consensus of the grandest order, uh, which is now called the rules-based order at sea. So if that's us, if that's our end goal, then what strategies ought we to adopt? Should our strategies be solely limited to matching technology with technology and therefore proceeding down a road of symmetry? Are there options available for going down asymmetric paths? In symmetry, ought we to match every technological advancement of China or the PLA Navy with an equivalent technolo technological advancement of our own? Perhaps there are significant variations in regional abilities to do this. And perhaps we need to examine more closely uh, the manners in which we can A, play at the strategic level, play at the level of operational art, and not necessarily in purely symmetrical terms. The next and last point I wanted to make in this regard is that you know we are moving away from a process of alliances to a process of strategic partnerships of different uh, uh, hierarchical levels, and in the process we are finding to our um, to our hope that the surest way of handling or or containing the more uh, absurd. Um, manifestations of, or the most dangerous manifestations of China's uh, rapid rise is perhaps to stitch the regions of the world together much more closely. And here, I think two major structures of IPOI on the one hand and Quad on the other hand are now doing just that. They are trying to stitch 
this region of the Indo-Pacific together so that we do not leave cracks and fissures through which China at the strategic level can make an entry. But that doesn't mean that we should trust in China. We should perhaps trust in China, but we should keep our powder dry. How would we do that? How should we best do that? First of all, we have to understand where China is, where it's coming from, and where it's going in terms of naval power, by which I now narrow my field down from maritime power uh, to a more uh, close manifestation of hard power, and that is naval power. The two are not the same, of course, as everybody here knows. And thereafter, to see whether we can actually find regional responses that will leverage the strengths that we have, not necessarily, as I said, in the same area. Somebody, some countries are blessed with better geographies. Last point of this point is that God, God gave, during the Cold War, God gave NATO the Greenland, Iceland, UK, Duke gap. God gives us the Strait of Ombai Weta. Uh, if we are unable to leverage these God-given gifts, I think that we would do well to remember that it is unwise to scorn or spurn the gifts of gods. And that's what I really wanted to lay out as a broad sort of thinking platform before diving into uh, the many nuts, many bolts, many pitch of nut, a uh, pitch of the bolt and pitch of the nut details, and also the grand structures that our uh, various panelists are quite capable of um, seamlessly moving from one into the other. So with that, let me turn to our first panelist, uh, once again, to uh, Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt, uh, and ask him to talk to us about the PLA Navy, its modernization, its expansion. Give us a sense also of is it that ought to concern India the most? In other words, Michael, what will, what do you hope India, maritime India will do? What do you expect maritime India to do, which may not be the same as what you hope? What do you hope we will not do? And in what manner, therefore, can the United States and India leverage their newfound partnership in dealing with a rampant, uh, aggressive China. So it's across over, uh, over to you, Michael. So would you take it away? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral Schwann. Uh, delight, uh, my pleasure to be with you uh, again. Uh, and I look forward to our discussions. And I wanna thank uh, ICS for the opportunity to be uh, a member of such a distinguished panel. Uh, you gave me a, quite an agenda of things to address. Um, uh, and so I'm going to move quickly through this for the 12 minutes that I have. I think the first thing to keep in mind is to repeat the point you made that uh, the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping has specifically laid out a, a roadmap in terms of time, uh, in terms of uh, the military modernization of the PLA. And he expects the PLA to be a world-class military by the year 2049. Now, it's important to know that he has not particularly defined or precisely defined what world-class means. And so to a degree, it will be in the eye of the beholder. Um, but more importantly, in terms of dates, he's also indicated that he expects the capabilities uh, the hardware, if you will, and, and, and much of the command and control infrastructure and what have you associated with being a world-class Navy and in the case we're talking about to be largely completed by 2035. And that is only 13 years away. And so uh, it's something that uh, is not in the too distant future and based upon what China has been able to do over the past uh, 15 years or so uh, is not at all an unrealistic aspiration. Uh, you asked me to talk about uh, PLA Navy focus areas. Uh, and to me, it doesn't appear that the PLA Navy is uh, trying to specialize or focus in any particular area of naval warfare. 
Instead, it is developing capabilities across the entire spectrum of naval warfare. In short, it is taking very seriously its task of becoming world-class. It is modernizing or introducing capability in every facet of the naval endeavor. Nothing has been overlooked. Some specific examples. A large, I'd say over 50, but 55 increasingly modern submarine force, a mix of nuclear powered and modern conventional boats. Secondly, a maritime leg of their China's nuclear IC, uh, uh, nuclear triad, their ICBMs is quite impressive. Six SSBNs are already in commission with two more building. And I would point out this is a force that will, is equal to today and it will be soon larger than that of the United Kingdom and France. A large force of, a, of large amphibious ships that have global projection capability. This is a blue water amphibious force in, that includes eight modern LPDs and just in a year or, uh, or so, the two recently launched flat deck a LHD uh, class ships will have completed fitting out. So what does this mean? Um, depending upon how many troops you assign to each one of those, um, at some point in the not too distant future, the PLN, PLAN could deploy upwards of 7,500 Marines to any spot in the world. In the world, this is a global projection force. The PLAN has been patiently introducing sea-based tactical uh, uh, aviate, naval aviation. Its two medium-sized carriers are in commission with a third full-size catapult-equipped carrier in the works. Uh, to me, the biggest mystery of their carrier development is, uh, is the limited focus that is placed on the most important part of having a carrier capability, and that's the airplane. Uh, but it's apparently solved its carrier-based tactical aircraft shortfall by extending or planning to extend the production run of the, uh, of the J-15 and modifying it so that it can be used uh, on this new full-sized uh, catapult-equipped carrier when it uh, shows up and eventually uh, uh, introducing a fourth-generation fighter um, based on uh, what is sometimes uh, called there. It's F-31. It's a it's a stealthy uh, uh, aircraft that is apparently uh, was just recently shown at the Singapore Air Show and uh, uh, and uh, is uh, uh, available for foreign sales. So they have almost three dozen modern multi-mission Aegis-like Aegis-like uh, DDGs in commission with at least six more buildings. These are large, well-equipped ships complemented by over 30 blue water capable frigates and all 65 or so of, uh, of uh, modern warships. And importantly, the point is all of these, all of the ones I'm talking about have been commissioned since 2005. The PLAN has built an impressive at sea replenishment force of 12 large multi-product ships that can support a modestly sized or uh, global uh, or surface force somewhere, or again, anywhere in the globe. Uh, I, now, taking a look at the Navy, the PLA Navy through the prism of naval warfare areas, in other words, anti-submarine warfare, strike warfare, surface combat, uh, anti-air warfare, they're the strongest, they are strongest in anti-surface capability thanks to their uh, long-range anti-ship cruise missiles and their well-equipped destroyers. They are weak in the areas of strike warfare and anti-submarine warfare because strike warfare depends upon sea-based air power largely. They do have land attack cruise missiles, uh, but th that's a, those are a modest, a, a modest amount of firepower compared to uh, the, having the ability to repetitively strike with airplanes. And they're, they're weak in ASW because, strike, quite frankly, it's damn hard. It's damn hard to find submarines. Uh, I spent most of my career trying to do that, largely unsuccessfully. And because strike warfare, excuse me, the PLAN is investing considerable effort in uh, a, a, a really robust ASW capability in, within the first island chain. 
They've commissioned some 70 odd uh, new Corvettes. They've got land-based ASW specialized aircraft. They've got sea bottom acoustic uh, arrays, detection systems, and island-based helicopters in the South China Sea. And so largely they are putting in place what I would say a fairly uh, ro- uh, reasonably effective if it can be knitted together with a sound command and control organization. And that is, that is uncertain in my mind, uh, to be able to deal with submarines within the first island ship. In blue water operations, that's quite a different matter. Now, all of its destroyers and frigates are equipped with a full suite of ASW combat systems and embarked helicopters. Now, whether these equipments and their sailor operators are effective in detecting and local submarine and localizing a submarine is unknown. This is a imp- very important point because it relates directly to how effectively the PLA can uh, secure its trans-Indian uh, Ocean sea lane. I think the need to protect its sea lanes, particularly across the Indian Ocean, will eventually create a demand for airfields along the Indian Ocean uh, littoral that can accommodate maritime patrol aircraft, uh, such as uh, Sri Lanka's Raja Pasca International. Uh, and it's worth noting that the Cambodian airfield that they're building at Dara uh, Sakar, um, if you fly directly uh, west across the Isthmus of Kra, it's only 1,450 miles between that and uh, Dara Pasca in Hambantota. So you have nice overlapping arcs for maritime patrol aircraft uh, uh, there. Turning to air defense, when surface ships are accompanied by an aircraft carrier and surround an eight to 10 uh, DDGs, I would say they'd have a very good uh, air defense capability uh, at sea. Um, Finally, we can't overlook the 11 blue water capable uh, AGIs, intelligence gathering ships, or sometimes referred to in the press, or often referred to in the press as spy ships, and a very robust oceanographic research force. In summary, this is a world-class Navy already, and it's still growing in size and capability. No one knows how large it's going to become. Its ultimate force size objectives are classified. And barring a, a serious economic downturn, that China's Navy will certainly be much larger in 13 years than it is today. Quickly on, on doctrine, you asked me about doctrine and organizational issues. Doctrine's a big topic. Uh, it's especially beloved by armies and air forces, and it's not so much by navies, because war at sea is very different from war on, uh, on or over the land. There is no front line and threats can come from any direction. Conceptually, the wise doctrinal view for a sea commander is to assume that one is always on the verge of being surrounded. If I had to describe PLA doctrine, uh, it is sea control within the first island chain and sea denial between the first and second island chain. And I would add sea denial in the Northern Indian Ocean. In this latter case, space-based surveillance systems seems to be in place as are the anti-ship ballistic missile DF-26 class that can reach into the Northern Indian Ocean. So I would say that China is on the verge of putting in place or building uh, a credible sea denial capability through much of, through the Northern portion of the, of the Indian Ocean. And that includes, of course, would include the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. I would say the, uh, let me switch to the last, my time is running out and I want to finish here with uh, this, the big, or biggest organizational issue that I think is uh, the PLA Navy faces and the PLA quite frankly faces. Uh, and that, that is uh, how well they do in building their, their joint force. Uh, they've been at this now six years and this is a Xi Jinping uh, specific uh, demand signal for them. He is the one who broke the uh, iron rice bowls and put in place uh, a, a plan uh, that is we're watching unfold as we speak and turning the 
uh, PLA into a credible joint warfighting capability. And as you know, individual services have been removed from the operational chain and five unified theater commands have, have been established. Uh, and the three extant Chinese fleets, the North Sea, North East and South Seas Fleet are now known as theater command fleets and they report, report directly to the Northern Eastern and Southern theater commander who commanders who in turn each report to the Central Military Commission in Beijing. What this major reorganization does not address is who's in charge of expeditionary forces that may be operating thousands of miles away from China. Theater commands are focused on China's periphery, its near seas, in the case of the Navy. A decision has not yet been made, to my knowledge, as to who will have command authority for the operations in the Indian Ocean, for example. One of four or five possible options uh, are, uh, uh, could be used. One of them is the current arrangement, which is today's anti-piracy forces that operate the PLA Navy's anti-piracy task forces. They report to Navy headquarters in Beijing, who in turn then uh, coordinate with the Central Military Commission's Joint Staff Department. This has worked well over the last decade and a, this small peacetime operation. But I think it's a problem that needs to be solved in the long term, especially if China envisions a more substantial naval presence, particularly in the Western Indian Ocean. I won't go, I can answer, deal with the other op, uh, alternatives uh, in the Q&A if it comes up. So let me, let me finish up here by saying that, what's the future development for the PLA Navy? I think it's more of the same. Uh, we're just going to continue to watch them uh, uh, grow. And if we look at what they've done over the last 15 years, it's not certainly not, uh, not unreasonable to expect they could do the same over the next 15 years in terms of capability. I expect to see uh, the, the PLA Air Force become more expeditionary. Uh, and that means that they need to have access to airfields, uh, uh, particularly along the Indian Ocean uh, uh, literal. So that would be something I would keep, a, keep in mind is that they're going to mimic the U.S. Air Force's vision of uh, expeditionary detachments or, or, or task forces of tactical airplanes, not just, uh, uh, not just heavy lift or, or surveillance airplanes. And obviously, the uh, strategic support force is going to have space and cyber uh, capability. They already have it, that any kind of a conflict, they, they're going to be front and center and they will certainly play in the Indian Ocean uh, region. So the one bit of advice I would have for the Indian Navy is you have to learn how to operate without space-based surveillance and data links. You have to learn to operate using uh, unmanned drones and what have you to be your connection in the sky to be able to link data links and voice communications and what have you. Uh, because if you're basing and or depending upon satellite communications uh, um, and other fixed facilities, it can be uh, can be jammed or, or uh, disabled by cyber attacks. Uh, you're going to be out of business, and that that would that also would hold true for holds true for the United States Navy and what it needs to deal with. So basically, we have to learn how to fight using local communications enabled by uh, unmanned aircraft or, or, or relay aircraft and what have you, as opposed to using satellite systems to, uh, to provide the appropriate footprint. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. And uh, without any further delay, let me uh, thank you for some uh, very, very uh, insightful comments. Uh, the ORBAT and uh, whether or not ORBAT ought to be a uh, preoccupation, and if so, what ought to be the, the, the more reasonable ones. But let me switch over to a completely different facet of our discussion and uh, turn to um, Dr. Darshana Barua, uh, who uh, will perhaps be able to offer some thoughts on uh, the Australian and US uh, responses to the PLA modernization from her perspective. Uh, I, I do want to make one general comment, and that is that we are uh, kind of tight for time uh, and so I'm going to ask everybody to limit their 
comments to about 10 minutes. And then when I, and I'll of course get off the um, video. And if I come up frowning fierce, fiercely or uh, uh, smiling beatifically or hoping to do so, you know that you've got about a minute left. So thank you very much. And Darshana, would you like, us, uh, like to share your thoughts with us? Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Thank you, Admiral Chauhan and Ambassador Kantha and ICS for uh, this invitation to speak at this uh, panel. I just wanted to say uh, I didn't catch it earlier. I'm no longer based in Delhi. I am now in Washington, D.C. So it's been uh, good to share some perspective from here uh, as well uh, in terms of what's happening in the region. Um, I, I do want to start with a, just a very brief. It's, it's great to it, it's hard to follow Admiral McDavid, but then it's also great because uh, Admiral's done a really good job of saying what are what are the nuts and bolts and uh, the technical side of what the uh, PL and AV is doing. Um, in my abstract, I was also kind of requested to look at a little bit in the Indian Ocean region, uh, and that is something that I'm doing here, uh, running the Indian Ocean Initiative. And I do see when I look at the Chinese Navy in the next five to ten years, in the immediate future, I do see a more um, expansion or presence or increasing presence in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, one misunderstanding that I see is that the Ch Chinese coming into the Indian Ocean or the interest is new or it's an expansion of what China has been doing in the South China Sea because I think China has been um, looking or engaging in the Indian Ocean region consistently for, for decades now. China is the only country with an embassy in each of the island nations in the Indian Ocean region looking at the Indian Ocean region as a whole from the Eastern coast, from the Straits of Malacca to the Eastern coast of Africa in a way that most navies in the Indian Ocean region perhaps do not. The focus definitely is in the Northern Indian Ocean region, but but in, in my conversations and research, there is a, there, there, there are hints that perhaps uh, the Chinese enjoy a little bit of uh, wiggle room in, in, in setting up something or, or creating more conversations from the Western Indian Ocean side of it because, the, uh, because that is one aspect of the Indian Ocean that perhaps goes missing or goes under the radar in conversation amongst many. Even, in, even whether it's the US or Australia and you talk about uh, in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean in it, it sort of stops in the Northern Indian Ocean. It stops with India, it stops with Maldives. So everything West of India and Maldives is essentially becomes an, another issue. Issue. And when you talk about Africa or when you talk about kind of Middle East, it becomes very much continental issues, leaving aside, leaving out the maritime side of it. Um, and I think that is definitely a gap that perhaps um, I see uh, a Beijing uh, leveraging. Uh, Admiral McDevitt also talked about uh, sea lines of communication and how that is going to be important to China. The 2020, the 2021 uh, report on China military power identifies top 10 crude oil suppliers to, uh, uh, to Beijing. And out of the 10, the route to nine of them are dependent on, in the Indian, on the Indian Ocean region. So it is going to be vital that, that our Chinese interests are not going to go down uh, or, uh, away from the Indian Ocean region, or it's not something new. It is something that perhaps they have been thinking about for a, lo for a long period of time, but it is something that they would have to um, start working on or will start or their activities will become much more visible. It already has in terms of their presence. Uh, the panels already mentioned Chinese activities in the Indian Ocean region through anti-piracy mission, which was also the mission through which when they first sent submarines. So it is obviously the assets deployed are not necessarily um, at the same is the required assets for the mission at hand. Uh, but those but those have been areas or ways in which China has come into the Indian Ocean region or are or, or, or gaining experience in, the, in, in that region. Um, beyond, beyond Chinese ships, uh, naval ships, I think there's also research and fishing vessels for recon and surveillance that, has, that, that Beijing had most certainly employed. And, um, and, and one thing, uh, if on the Pacific or on the South China Sea, China has been very aggressive militarily and very assertive militarily because that is the immediate region and China perhaps sees a valid um, justification for behaving a certain way. On the Indian Ocean side, the military aspect is hidden and I think it is more on the military diplomacy, political engagement and diplomatic engagement across the region and which has been very consistent and I think it has been very coherent across the Indian Ocean region. Um, if a second facility comes up, 
I think Hambundoda was a good example that every, everything on the eastern side will be very well watched and and China will Beijing will face a lot of pushback but on the western side perhaps it will get uh, swept under the uh, geographical distance of the Indian Ocean with with the assumption that it's too far away and maybe it wouldn't have that much of an impact across the Indian Ocean region if a, if a facility were to, if an additional facility were to come up uh, in the Western Indian Ocean side of it. And I think that perhaps that would be an area where we might see more um, uh, presence and, uh, and Chinese um, uh, collaborations in that, uh, in that area. In terms of the um, regional response, of course, there's the bigger players in the region, whether it's India, US, Japan, uh, Australia, France, who are responding to it. But in terms of smaller countries in the region, I think it's, it is worth noting that uh, um, that I, I think it was Admiral Chauhan who mentioned that, you know, are we willing to live with one country defining uh, the rules of the game and, and, and should it be one nation or one country saying this is how, uh, this is how uh, the, um, uh, the rules from here on would go. But from a smaller nation point of view, uh, whether it is Sri Lanka to all the way to Comoros or you look at Bangladesh or you look at other littoral states, I think that's how they have been feeling about the traditional powers in the Indian Ocean region or whether it's even in the Pacific, which is which would be France, uh, India in the Indian Ocean or US, Australia, where to say that it has been monopolized by three, four countries for very long. So China is the welcome alternative. So I think a lot of smaller nations and littorals welcome Chinese presence in the region because of diplomatic and political engagement with the countries, with the littoral countries by bigger players who perhaps uh, had become pretty, um, uh, had, had, had taken a few things for granted or a place in the region. So from a regional response, if you are, I think the regional response would be broken down into regional response of bigger navies and regional response of littoral states and island nations. And I think both look at the issue slight, uh, slightly differently. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of Australia and US, uh, Australia and US have both put out uh, their Indo-Pacific strategies and white papers and defense uh, uh, defense priorities, and over the years, the the, the latest versions of for each country has been pretty um, clear in identifying China as a threat, as a competitor, as a kind of biggest um, challenge facing the nations in the region. Um, some of the concerns for Australia and US at this point might not exactly align with India, such as the Taiwan Strait, where it might not hold the same level of priority, but it is definitely on the same page in terms of facing a China challenge in its immediate neighborhood. Um, there are a lot of initiatives uh, that both Australia and, and US do in terms of collaborations and exercises in the region, but both Australia and United States have identified alliances and partnerships as a way to respond to a growing Chinese presence in the region, um, uh, strengthening uh, and expanding the scope and complexity of uh, reach, uh, naval exercises, um, providing, um, working on initiatives like Pacific Deference Initiative or Maritime Security Initiative. Australia has a Pacific step, step out, which they are investing quite a bit in, able, in, in a way to engage more in the region and deny China uh, um, or, or at least maintain its own um, own presence and uh, importance in the in, in the region. But I think uh, even amongst countries that uh, that are on the same page on identifying China as a threat or 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 a competitor, there are huge geographical distances and geographical priorities. Take the Quad. I think uh, amongst the Quad. Um, and there's some leveraging from having actually lived in all the four quad countries at this point in time. I think the definition, the geographical definition of, of the Indo-Pacific itself is very different. For, for India, the priority always will be Indian Ocean region. For Australia, it'll always be South Pacific. For Japan, it'll always be Northeast Asia. And for US, it'll be a little bit of uh, the across the Indo-Pacific drawing its own, own lines. So I think when push comes to shove, each country will, of course, prioritize its immediate neighborhood that might not have an overlap. But on issues and on issues such as anti-submarine warfare and on issues such as maritime domain awareness, on issues in terms of upholding a particular set of norms, rules and, and way of operating in the maritime domain, these are on, on issue-based coalitions are what probably uh, we would see going forward and how countries are choosing to respond. Um, on alliances, of course, uh, US has um, 
I, uh, over and over now identified alliances as its biggest strength in responding to a China challenge and how it can um, help modernize the treaty allies such as uh, Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, Philippines, Thailand. The um, AUKUS deal is also essentially one, one aspect of such a, such a conversation and such a um, uh, arrangement to 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 work between allies on what can be done at Bolshevik. I see you, uh, but just to sort of uh, uh, wrap it wrap it up. I think in terms of um, the last point that I want to say was in terms of challenges and cooperation in the region. I think geography. If geography is a challenge in terms of priority, geography is also an advantage. I think Admiral Chauhan already mentioned some of those key points. Uh, Surveillance and ability to operate and utilizing, I think, each other's territories for anti-submarine warfare and MDA, especially across straits, would be a key area where countries can work together. India today has Limoa with almost all the countries that are that have that are sitting in very geographically advantageous position. And if countries are able to utilize these agreements to actually deploy and operate from there, uh, that would be uh, that would that would be a new uh, uh, and innovative way of responding to some is responding to this challenge. Uh, but on uh, just as a concluding thought, I think perhaps even with uh, identifying and realizing China as a common challenge, I think there is value in, especially in Asia, especially for India, perhaps in um, exploring the concept of burden sharing and how countries, different countries can together uh, can work on a particular set of issues, leveraging the capabilities and resources that are natural and important uh, and available to them because no country can essentially stretch itself. Not, I think not even the United States at this point in time, the US Indo-Pacific strategy, a 20 page document mentions Indian Ocean only twice in passing. So it is not, no country is gonna be able to be present across the Indo-Pacific uniformly at all times. And I think burden sharing will probably have to be the way forward for this. Um, I'll stop here, I'm sorry for going over. No, thank you very much. That was very succinct and very rapid staccato. Uh, and yet you uh, delivered quite a lot of uh, content. I, I just wanted to uh, turn the uh, conversation over now to Dr. Colin Coe, another old friend and uh, uh, colleague in many uh, seminars. Uh, Colin, uh, you know, the Southeast Asian uh, countries in general and ASEAN in particular has been declared as the central pivot for everything that we're talking about uh, in uh, terms of the Indo-Pacific and yet uh, each one of us is looking keenly uh, at the ASEAN uh, and Southeast Asian nations to be able to figure out whether what Darshana said uh, about uh, having uh, rules-based orders being viewed differently by smaller powers. Uh, Darshana, uh, I also will call in wonder whether you want to comment on the fact that after all, uh, we began this whole process of UNCLOS way back in 1958 and from 1958 to 1982, Almost everybody in the uh, in the region of the Indo-Pacific has had ample opportunity to weigh in and uh, declare whatever concerns that they might have had on the rules-based order. Uh, and insofar as burden sharing is concerned, perhaps you would also like us uh, like to talk to us about the interface between perhaps the WPNS and uh, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium or IONS. So uh, over to you, Colin. That's all asked, but you're good good for it, I'm sure. Ten minutes. Uh, thank you, Emma Chohan, for your very kind introduction. It's good to see you again, and it's good to be invited by ICS to this very distinguished panel. I, I'm certainly, I pale uh, in comparison to the giants that sat alongside me in this panel, and I would just want to share my views uh, based on the set of questions that were provided. And of course, Emma Chohan, you asked additional questions about the interface between uh, IONS and WPNS. I'll try to answer that. Uh, I may not be able to satisfy everybody with the answer, but I'll try. But let me just look at the PLAN's modernization and Southeast Asia's response. I remember just now at the very beginning, Admiral Chow Han, you talk about geography, right? And I would have to say that Southeast Asia's geography is a boon and a bane to the whole region. Uh, it is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. And this does shape Southeast Asia's response to not just the PLA Navy modernization, but by the extension, the presence of other extra-regional navies around. And 
it, it really does uh, you know, require mention that Southeast Asian waters, given the geography that it straddles between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, thereby it is considered international in a sense. I mean, if you think about uh, on clause earlier, I mean, that was what Emma Chohan mentioned earlier. The, the reason why Malacca Strait, for example, was thereafter designated as streets used for international navigation is precisely because of the geography and the fact that it has been a very much used waterway for the world's powers till these days. So it's very difficult to imagine Southeast Asia waters to be devoid of these presents going forward. And not to mention how the PRA Navy and its modernization will have an impact on the way the region views China in, in that respect. But first up, I think let me just highlight here that you know, Southeast Asia is made up of a diverse array of countries. We have all 10 of them. Not all of them necessarily find the PLA Navy modernization a threat to their security. Mainland countries in Southeast Asia will tend to focus on social economic development and some of them even rely heavily on China for their, their own naval modernization. So if you treat China as a threat, then it, it isn't very logical to imagine that they will rely on China for their naval needs in the first place, right? And if you want to really look at you know, some kind of response from Southeast Asian countries to the PLA Navy modernization, then I think more logically is to focus on the South China Sea parties with disputes with China. But at the same time, if you look at their responses, it is not necessarily balancing against China, but because they have other pressing maritime security challenges to tackle at the same time. Several Southeast Asian countries will at least feel a sense of uncertainty towards the PLA Navy modernization, not least because of the black box of Beijing's intention, coupled with the growing assertiveness at the same time is economic outreach to Southeast Asia. So in a way, it's kind of a schizophrenic uh, you know, relationship <laughs> that, that we, are, we are looking at. But if we talk about the response of Southeast Asia to the Chinese naval modernization, and some like to use the term arms race, which um, I strictly caution against, there is not going to be an arms race between any Southeast Asian countries individually or collectively against China simply because the asymmetry between the militaries of Southeast Asia and China are quantitatively and increasingly qualitatively too wide to even talk about. So Southeast Asian militaries, in particular the navies, are trying to play what we call qualitative catch-up. But then again, the issue here is we have somewhat passed the useful shelf life when comes to talking about this qualitative uh, parity in the first place, right? Individual capabilities in Southeast Asian navies are increasingly outpaced by the PLA Navy modernization. Give a good example. Until the early 2000s, there is some parity in anti-ship cruise missile capabilities. But after that, China moved on to equip ships with larger batteries of anti-ship missiles and supersonic anti-ship missiles but Southeast Asian navies remain largely static in their respect. And to top it off, to make it worse, shipboard anti-air warfare capabilities were frozen in the 1990s era. Only a few Southeast Asian countries possess effective anti-air warfare capabilities against high-performance aircraft and missiles. And that is not to forget mentioning that the Chinese anti-ship missile buildup has effectively outstripped the Southeast Asian Navy's shipboard anti-air warfare capabilities. And of course, much of the most up-to-date naval hardware in Southeast Asia were procured in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And if you compare with the latest in the stable house of the PRA Navy, most of them are barely 10 years old. Most are less than that. But for Southeast Asian navies, most of the hardware in service are already at least 20 years old in total. And there is a question associated with the fleet availability and readiness. And that is something that is not very much talked about, but it is important. And of course, the procurement process was interrupted by two major economic crises, the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s and the 2008 global economic recession. 
and the PLA Navy is increasingly focused on war fighting operations and cutting down on littoral forces. So there, are, there is one very interesting report that came out that many of the Type 0, 59, uh, 056 corvettes are reportedly converted into China Coast Guard carters. And this does point to the PLA Navy focusing on blue water assets. And there is a clearer division of responsibility between the Navy and the Coast Guard. Now, the Coast Guard has the primary task of safeguarding China's maritime sovereignty and rights in the disputed waters, and the PLA Navy will it continue to play a much bigger recess deterrence role in that regard. At the same time, by contrast, many Southeast Asian countries, their navies remain heavily skewed towards constabulary functions that perform the dual roles of war fighting and peacetime missions at the same time. Now, it's important if we look at the response of Southeast Asia to the PLA Navy modernization, we should not forget mentioning the COVID-19 situation. It does aggravate the situation. Now, Southeast Asia countries are focused on social economic recovery and pandemic control. There is some economic growth last year, but the current pandemic wave cast doubt on the future prospects. So and over the years, COVID-19 response resulted in ballooning debts in those countries. At the same time, public clamor for public health care and social security because of the pandemic will mean that defense and security spending will fall under increased scrutiny and resistance. With the exception of a few Southeast Asian countries, most are likely to be conservative with defense spending. They are geared more towards the maintenance of existing assets, less so on major acquisitions going forward in the coming years. Two exceptions that I talked about. Indonesia is embarking on an apparent arms shopping spree. You have read about the news just recently about the Rafael deal, but earlier there were some deals regarding the naval arena. And of course, the bigger question is if the build-up is going to be financed largely by domestic and the foreign uh, debt instruments, then now the question is in the long-term intergenerational debt issue is going to hobble Indonesia going forward. The Philippines has seen very interesting arms acquisition recently and quite notably, of course, is the purchase of the BrahMos missile from India. And the thing is that, you know, for the Philippines, the current context is important to underline its current shopping spree. Now, it is more like a last burst shopping before Duterte ends his term in a few months' time. Going forward, they are not too sure whether the new president is going to cut back on defense spending thereafter. So thereby, before everything ends, before the party is over, get all the fun as you can from there. Okay? So that is the Philippines. Otherwise, most of the Southeast Asian countries are embarking on what we will largely call maintenance activities for their naval arms build-up. Now, given this existing problem, so what's next? I think what we can think about is the history of Southeast Asia's response when it comes to the, the, the sort of perception of uncertainty as well as a threat from outside. So we call that the dual pillar strategy, if, if, if I, I, can, I can say that. So on the one hand, national self-help, and on the other hand, co-opting extra-regional parties to aid in regional peace and stability. National self-help is conditioned by priorities that are mainly skewed towards domestic or internal security and thereby social economic development. COVID-19 puts strain on this national self-help, thereby elevating the importance of ex external balancing by extra-regional parties. Extra-regional parties are going to be increasingly prominent in Southeast Asia. Last year alone, it is unprecedented. The French Navy nuclear attack submarine traversed the South China Sea. The United Kingdom Terror Strike Group 21 did the same. The German Navy frigate did the same as well. And for AUKUS, despite all the earlier misgivings from Indonesia and Malaysia, thereafter, it all toned down and it appeared that, you know, the Southeast Asian countries do actually secretly welcome AUKUS as a potential countervailing instrument. So if I could sum up briefly, is that going forward, we're going to see sluggish naval response by Southeast Asia to the PLA Navy modernization. They are going to be bogged down by constabulary responsibilities, thereby leading to potentially suboptimal response to the PLA Navy modernization. The status quo will mainly be for some Southeast Asian countries' rather chaotic maritime security architectures 
characterized by multiple agencies, sharing redundancies, overlapping mandates and jurisdictions, turf wars, and inter-service rivalries. At the same time, procurement policies will be hampered by internal governance issues, and COVID-19 is going to continue to put strain on national self-help, which means Southeast Asian countries will continue to maintain and enhance engagements with extra-regional parties. With that, I end my presentation. I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. And as always, it was a delight. Uh, although you didn't have time to uh, ask, uh, answer the supplementaries, but we might have some time in the Q&A. So uh, let me, in equally breathless fashion, now turn to our final panelist for today, and that is Captain KK Agnihotri, uh, whose book, uh, Leveraging High Technology Developments in the Military and Maritime Domains and the Impact on IOR Security, uh, I would strongly uh, commend to all the members of the audience. Uh, it's available, but this is not the time to plug the book. Uh, it is time to hand over the floor to him and to ask him to uh, examine what, or share what he might think are the Indian best or optimal Indian responses and whether we should actually be competing with China right across the entire technology domain or maritime or naval or whether we should be focusing upon one, two or three niche technologies and working our way from there. So uh, all those things are uh, for him to hopefully cast some light upon. So um, uh, Kamlesh, it's over to you. 10 minutes would be good. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman, sir, uh, for uh, talking about my book right in the beginning. I was going to talk about it in the end, but now uh, that you have done the honors, I will not uh, say any more. Thank you, uh, ICS, uh, for uh, providing me the opportunity for uh, presenting my views on uh, a panel which is as distinguished as this. I see Admiral McDevitt, uh, with whom I had the occasion to initially start work uh, in 2010. And uh, here, uh, world is a short place. Here I am back. Uh, seeing him after 10 or 11 odd years again. So uh, nicety is being over and time being at a premium, I would uh, straight away launch into uh, my uh, presentation. I had a PowerPoint presentation, but since none of the others uh, chose to show anything, so I will continue with my comments and 10 minutes is anyway a very short time. So taking off from what Madbrill McDavid said, the way China is going and the speed at which the PLA Navy is uh, expanding with the kind of shipbuilding uh, uh, rate being experienced since 2013, he has said that uh, there is no uh, guessing how large the Chinese Navy would become. But I would uh, like to refer to his uh, base figure of, uh, uh, say, 250 uh, or 270 uh, ships by 2035. And uh, coming to uh, the contemporary uh, times, I would say by 2024 or 2025, we will take a ballpark figure of 250 ships. And uh, catering for the geostrategic compulsions uh, on the Chinese side, I would say a ballpark figure of 30%, uh, which uh, China at best would be able to spare uh, for the Indian Ocean uh, uh, mission or deployment or projection, as you call it, would be around uh, 52 ships. But going uh, further by uh, to a more modest figure of 20%, it would uh, work out to 30-32 uh, uh, 30, ships. And I would further hazard a guess to make it more modest uh, and make it 10%. At 10%, it would be around 16 odd ships. And 16 odd ships uh, we have been seeing from 2000, uh, I would say 2017 onwards, when uh, in a three month window in 2017, there were 19 PLA Navy ships in the Indian Ocean region. So uh, since that time, we have been seeing an average of 10 to 12 ships in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean region, uh, which quite matches up with the uh, uh, figure of, I would say, 15 to 16, uh, that China would be able to uh, project uh, very comfortably into the Indian Ocean region. Of course, in peacetime, it is, it is, uh, there are no hassles, there are no risks. But in wartime, uh, that force will not be sufficient. And uh, I think uh, the, the, ra the rate at which China is building itself, that uh, particular uh, issue, uh, they will be surely looking at as to how they can uh, have a uh, 
protective umbrella over their force, maybe carrier based aircraft or shore based aircraft. As Admiral McDavid again mentioned, they are uh, trying to build something uh, across the Kra Stamas. Uh, and similarly, the uh, airports, airfields in Myanmar with little bit of uh, with little bit of persuasion, uh, uh, you know, uh, in what, what way uh, can be utilized from that side also. So uh, implications for India are very clear. Uh, the uh, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea is the primary area of uh, Indian Navy's operations, training, and uh, I would say uh, uh, mission readiness. And all of this will be affected if uh, 16 to 17 ships supported by some more auxiliaries and AGIs continue to crisscross all over the place. They can monitor, they can uh, do various things, they can uh, actually uh, restrict Indian uh, Navy's concept of operations and operational training. So uh, the implications are uh, pretty well known and they are detailed, but then we will not uh, talk more about it. Uh, so what should be the Indian responses and future plans? I would say that uh, while accepting the risks in maritime warfare is uh, axiomatic and its avoidance is rarely feasible, the pragmatism would call for an effort to reduce risks through comprehensive monitoring and credible control mechanisms. So two things, comprehensive uh, monitoring and credible control mechanisms. And pray, how does the Indian Navy uh, do all this? Where does it get resources from? So uh, I don't know if anybody looked at the defense budget, uh, which has been announced uh, a few days, uh, I would say two weeks back. Uh, and here, Indian Navy uh, gets a huge share in the capital budget allocation of 31%. Of course, uh, budget being limited, so I would like to call it a zero-sum game, wherein uh, if Navy has got so much, somebody would have uh, not got so much. And so... Uh, to the, uh, I would say, to the consternation of uh, our army brethren, their uh, capital budget allocation has reduced by 13%. We will not talk about army per se. We will be happy with what Navy is getting, 31%. Air Force uh, thing is uh, more or less constant. And uh, so what does the Navy do with this budget? Of course, this is not the first time. One swallow doesn't make a summer. It has been going on for some time that the Navy has been uh, getting an increasing share of the budget, but this time it has been quite uh, substantial. So what does it do with its capital allocation? I mean, we all know, I, I would just talk about major uh, capital acquisitions. Two Scorpion submarines were commissioned uh, last year. One Vishakapatnam class destroyer 15B, Project 15B was commissioned. The uh, MH-60R uh, 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 multi-role helicopters from US are coming. Similarly, uh, other issues. And in the two, 2022, we expect to see the commissioning of Vikrant aircraft carrier, fifth Scorpion submarine, and the second ship of the Vishakhapatnam class, which is going to be one of our uh, best uh, ships in the class. Not to mention the uh, ongoing uh, SSBN program, which has been going on for some time. Uh, of course, much detail is not known, but uh, broadly what is known is that possibly three uh, ships are, uh, three submarines are under construction, active construction. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, uh, what are the future plans? The Indian Navy always uh, has been uh, an early proponent of indigenization. Indigenization is coming up in a big way in, in, in India, and it is reflected in the Defense Procurement Procedure 2016. Con continuing on to the draft procedures of 2020, which should be uh, issued anytime soon. The uh, Indian Navy uh, planned to be a uh, 200 ship force, uh, 200 ship uh, force by 2027, uh, but now I believe uh, it is being toned down to 170 or 280 ships. Uh, there is no clarity, uh, official clarity on this issue. And uh, the uh, latest. Uh, Self-reliance document called Sovalamban, released by the Defense Minister in August of 2020, has laid down a roadmap for developing indigenous capabilities to enable the industry to better appreciate the Indian Navy's requirements and priorities. And in all this, as Admiral Chauhan uh, said, uh, uh, the focus is on certain niche technologies in which India is pretty good. One of them is, of course, the uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems. And the other thing is, uh, he had mentioned uh, Ombai Vetar Strait. Uh, so, in consonance with that, maybe some underwater sensors of that kind and a good going partnership with Indonesia uh, 
since uh, we are in the same organization i would like to uh, refer to one of his uh, comments uh, he says that indonesia is such an important country that if you see an indonesian maybe you you know don't uh, just just marry him or her don't bother about the uh, i would see the gender can be seen later so that is the kind of importance that indonesia has and we should leverage that by trying to build our underwater sensor capabilities arrays uh, and those kind of things and there is apparently some work going on in that so uh, and there so that is one part uh, what has not been said is that uh, the terms of reference given to me for this talk were also that what can we do with regard to increasing the capacity building the capacity and uh, augmenting the capability of the regional navies as well as of our own so towards uh, building the capacity and augmenting the capability of the of our own the one country with whom we are having a very stra uh, robust strategic partnership is the us and i would like to come to that i would uh, like to say that there are three strands of uh, building capability and uh, capacity of the uh, of our own uh, three strands and these strands would uh, revolve around uh, equipment acquisition and technology transfer that the first one second is the maritime exercises with the us and the third one is cooperative uh, policy prescriptions with regard to the equipment uh, and uh, acquisition and technology transfer we have seen p8 is coming in major uh, equipments there are so many other things happening predator and uh, sea guardian drones uh, being uh, negotiated the mh60r multi role helicopters are uh, two of them are coming out of 24 and a uh, host of things are uh, lined up in the army and air force domain but i am talking about the navy only maritime exercises uh, needless to say malabar series is going from strength to strength and uh, becoming greater in scope and scale and getting uh, uh, newer partnerships uh, into the uh, uh, into the uh, sir uh, admiral chauhan is smiling so i will wait for him till he frowns <laughs> and uh, the cooperative policy prescriptions these are the four uh, foundational agreements the first one was signed in 2002 and the last one was signed in 2020 the very fact that extended timeline of 18 odd years was taken to complete this process in itself is an indicator of the extent of rigor applied by both sides to the whole process uh, for arriving at mutual benefit mutually beneficial outcomes a very uh, unique kind of uh, i would say uh, interesting cooperative opportunity i would didn't want to miss it because admiral mcdevit is here it is a little out of the box but worth considering the india has created a niche capability in opvs and uh, opc building our shipyards uh, produce uh, world class opvs at about 40 to 50 million uh, dollars a piece and our understanding is that the us coast guard uh, plans to procure eight of the bigger ships they call it nscs 25 opcs and 58 fpcs now if uh, some of these things could be procured from india obviously the us coast guard would save huge sums uh, from uh, you know such buys however i believe the jones act does not allow us to make foreign buys so in that case us could adopt a clamp kind of a model that is contractor leased and manned patrolling to circumvent this technicalities uh, the us military contractors have been uh, doing it uh, in uh, various domains in the particularly in the army field so it's nothing new this will cause a win win outcome for both our countries and open new arenas for bilateral cooperative partnership i mean just to think of it we are buying uh, equipment and uh, 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 trying to transfer the technology from us how about uh, doing it in a reverse way uh, you know to a certain limited extent wherein the partnership is uh, i would say uh, uh, partnership is uh, becomes more and more uh, robust and interdependent so i would now like to conclude with regard to the indian options as the rapidly modernizing indian navy i would consider it as a crossroads at i would consider it as crossroads of choices it can follow the familiar plan into the future primarily augmenting the tried and tested capabilities that have proven their worth in the earlier era or it can place somewhat less reliance on traditional force accretions while exploiting rapidly emerging technologies to create a smart fleet to address a different kind of emerging maritime challenges or the middle path choose a healthy mix of both traditional augmentation 
and emerging high technologies therein for optimal operational efficiency and this is where i would like to come back to the question uh, the chairman uh, asked as to uh, what all emerging technologies can we uh, reasonably easily uh, uh, i would say uh, incorporate or internalize so as to get best operational efficiencies and as i have answered uh, one of the things are the uavs and other is the underwater sensor chains and uh, possibly uh, uh, the uh, i would i would uh, like to say that uh, the underwater vehicles uuvs that uh, our uh, drd organization particularly the nstl is uh, doing a great job about it so i would like to uh, stop at this particular point uh, and thank you chairman sir thank you very much uh, thank you for uh, a very comprehensive uh, approach and uh, sharing some really interesting uh, perspectives including the one of the us buying equipment from india uh, this will be an interesting avenue to explore i'm sure but we are um, uh, we are in grave danger of being buried under a flurry of questions so um, let me turn to our audience Uh, and as i speak uh, there are more questions pouring in uh, yet i feel strongly that uh, early birds must be allowed to catch the worm so to speak and um, i think that uh, we will start our question uh, with ambassador yogendra kumar's uh, our question answer series with admiral uh, with ambassador yogendra kumar's uh, question which is what is the panel's assessment of the uh, chinese naval capabilities in uuvs unmanned underwater vehicles and also have you any assessment of the incident involving the us uh, navy submarines uh, in the paracel water so let me ask uh, uh, colin whether you would like to take a stab at the first one and uh, whether admiral mcdevit would like to take a stab at the second question but please please be brief we have a huge array of questions in the pipeline thank you uh great uh emma chohan thank you so much for for this uh i will quickly address the first question on the pla navy uuv capabilities but more accurately one shouldn't confine uh to just looking at the pla navy's uuv capabilities what we are seeing here is an ecosystem in china on uuv development that straddles across the state owned um institutions Uh, in particular those uh, oceanography institutes there are three of them actually uh, in china as well as a number of technical universities in china that are involved in uuv research and development and these uuv technologies all together have dual application both civilian both military as far as uh, what i know about is that currently there is uh, quite a bit of uh, advances Uh, being made by the chinese in uuv development for example in the area of making biomimetic uuvs so meaning you know making the uuv operate and, and be able to swim like a, a sea creature for example a stingray a manta ray and you know even a fish for example and this forms part of the chinese attempt to try to set up you know a much more persistent underwater surveillance network in the near seas and we are looking at the south china sea being one potential area and the east china sea these uuvs are supposed to be the mobile surveillance assets for this eventual network that we're looking at so i think going forward we are seeing quite interesting significant developments in the uuv arena uh, not just with chinese navy but also across the other agencies uh, all together thank you Well that was um, that was very interesting thank you very much uh, Colin um and uh, let me ask uh, Admiral McDevitt whether he would like to say a few words about the second element of that these are the specific uh, incident of the submarine of the US submarine in the waters of the Paracel island group um first of all Uh, I have no idea where the incident, where the submarine, where it hit the seamount, where it was exactly, um, uh, and uh, not sure that the U.S. has uh, indicated where that was. Uh, and so, uh, I can say that in the past, uh, incidents with regard to the EP3 
uh, and in an uh, uh, impeccable incident uh, going way back to 2009. All of those took place uh, south of the Paracels. And uh, it should not be uh, a big surprise if you connect a couple of dots. Uh, first is the fact that Yulin, which is close to Sanya, is the, is the home port of where China's SSBNs are. So the fact that the U.S. and international waters is conducting uh, surveillance operations and what have you uh, should not be a big surprise. And so uh, whether there was a U.S. submarine there or not, I, have, I really don't, uh, honestly don't know one way or another, but uh, that area has been, those waters have seen a number of uh, U.S. Navy um, uh, PLA uh, 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 incidents over a decade and a half now, so we should not be surprised if more show up. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, as always, uh, most illuminating uh, response. But let me turn to the next question, and this is from... Uh, Vij, and uh, he asks, actually he asks you, but I'm going to exercise uh, a bit of uh, uh, chair prerogative. Uh, the question is really, uh, as um, has been said in order by, by Admiral Devitt, uh, in order to assert dominance in the northern Indian Ocean, China could explore the option of building airfields in, in, the, uh, in the littoral. And uh, considering the same thing, with strategic locations such as the Andaman and Nicobar Islands uh, resting with India, how best might we be able to uh, move so as to secure the Northern Indian Ocean? So I'm going to, since this question really has a pointed uh, frame of reference uh, centered upon the Andaman and Nicobar, I'm going to ask uh, Captain Agnihotri first whether he would like to offer a view and then turn it across to uh, Admiral McDevitt and perhaps to Darshana. Uh, for their quick views, because we, as I said, have many questions to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, sir, the uh, Andaman and Nicobar uh, Islands, of course, are very strategic uh, to India's point of view with regard to uh, uh, checking any adventure or misadventure from our eastern adversary. Uh, the uh, airfields that uh, Port Blair already existed, the airfield has been, uh, you know, we have... We have made our bigger airfields in Karnikovar and further down south. One more airfield is being made uh, in the northern Andamans. So uh, India is quite aware of the importance of airfields, uh, which can be used for leveraging the, uh, I would say, force multiplication matrix, if one were to say. Uh, there is no, uh, I would say there is a view in India uh, maybe it's an official view that uh, one should not uh, try to be seen to be overdoing it. There has to be a message passed in a subtle manner. I mean, that is part of the international diplomacy, uh, military or otherwise. And uh, the airfield capacities uh, are very much being created. Uh, the capabilities are being exercised uh, uh, on the mainland anywhere across. There are exercises uh, done to uh, project force, air force and uh, naval aviation from those airfields. Our uh, carriers go across and we do a, uh, uh, we would do a kind of uh, do ex exercise from those airfields. So uh, the capability very much is, exists. And I would say, uh, I would like to subtly put it as capability in being. What China is doing, I just mentioned uh, with regard to uh, Myanmar uh, airfields, trying to coerce them into using it against uh, 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 India, if India can be an adversary or uh, utilize the good offices of Pakistan for transit uh, or fly through uh, and uh, have those things. So uh, point is uh, well taken and we are also cognizant of using the uh, Andaman Nicobar territory for leveraging them as far as the airfields are concerned. Thank you very much. And so, uh, uh, Michael, would you like to add a couple of sentences there? And Darshan, would you like to talk about the uh, concept that people are occasionally voicing uh, about unsinkable aircraft carriers and islands and, you know, things that make naval officers generally wince. But uh, in, the, in the context of the, of the uh, uh, Coco Skeeling Island group of Australia uh, or Christmas Island, would you like to talk about those as options and why are we not uh, looking at uh, similar situations there? But first, uh, Admiral McDevitt.
Uh, Michael, you're muted. Uh, to, to clarify the point I made, uh, I wasn't talking about China dominating the northern Indian Ocean. I don't think that's possible. What I was talking about is China being interested in, in uh, both sea denial uh, operations as, as necessary should it come down to a shooting war between India and China. Uh, and uh, if that's not the case, but in any case, worrying about their sea lines of communication. Um, and the airfields, I think uh, history has shown, you need land-based uh, surveillance aircraft uh, to help you protect sea lanes against the marines. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm suggesting to you that uh, possibly uh, we're going to see uh, PLA Air Force, PLA Navy Air Force land-based aircraft operating uh, along the Indian Ocean. Okay, so thanks. And uh, let me let me ask Darshana if you would like to weigh in. Uh, Michael, always a pleasure. Yep. Yeah, just uh, just quickly to say that uh, absolutely, I think um, everyone said Andaman's a great location. And um, uh, Admiral Chauhan, like you said, I've actually written about uh, working together using Andamans and Coco Skeeling of Australia because it does provide really uh, great advantages over the, I think, some of the streets through which submarines can come in. So I definitely see that as a way that can be taken forward, especially with Limo having signed on both sides of the uh, aisle. I'll just stop at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me jump to the next question from Nirmal Panda. I'm not sure how well we're doing in racing against the clock, but... Uh, his question is uh, really uh, one of uh, oft-repeated skepticism within India, saying that um, specifically to India, and so Kamlesh, this is really your, your question. Uh, it says, keeping the slow pace, I, uh, I just dragged that word slow, uh, pace of naval modernization in view, how do you think the, uh, that India or its Navy would be able to really play a significant role in multinational organizations such as Quad? to protect Indian interests in the Indian Ocean region. Obviously, there are many value judgments being made here, but nevertheless, uh, maybe you can help dispel the wrong ones and reinforce the right ones. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there are two questions uh, asked in uh, this particular, uh, that, I, that I discern. One is slow pace of uh, our uh, modernization, and second is uh, our role and uh, uh, place in the Quad. I would say... Uh, we have our own plan of being uh, close to 200 uh, ships Navy by 2027 and uh, we are working towards that. Of course, things are uh, not as fast as China. Uh, we don't produce 13 ships uh, in one uh, year, but that is not the intention. The, uh, I think for our uh, requirements and to meet our uh, security requirements for primary and secondary areas of maritime interest, we are uh, we are working to a plan, and uh, however slow it may appear, from uh, I would say for the non-initiated, it is not uh, it is meets our requirement. Secondly, we don't have to get into an arms race with China or any other country. Our security uh, paradigm, our security requirements, uh, and security uh, uh, concept is based on our requirements uh, that we have foreseen, and we find them quite sufficient. Now, what happens is that uh, just because uh, Somebody says that we have not got as big a Navy as the U.S. Navy or uh, uh, so we will be a minor or a bit player in the quad. That's not the thing. There are two issues. One is the geography, which uh, uh, one of the panelists and chairman, of course, alluded to it. We are centrally located in the Indian Ocean region. So we are a major central player into the quad as far as we are concerned. And uh, we bring to uh, bear the, uh, our capacities and the capabilities to uh, be a net security provider in the region, as also be the first responder in HADR uh, issues. We have seen that the Quad is building up on uh, various uh, non-traditional uh, security challenges also. And if that be so, then we are, of course, a major player and not to, uh, I would say, undermine the role of other players. So uh, as a person who is working in the maritime domain, uh, I would uh, like to uh, dispel both the counts that the, we could be, we were a minor player in this thing and we are going slow on modernization. That's my take. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. And uh, let me turn back to um, uh, Admiral McDevitt. Uh, this is a question from our host, Ambassador Ashok Kanta. And he asks, what kind of network of bases and places do you expect China to develop uh, so as to buttress force projection capabilities of the PLA Navy? Now, this is really important because uh, what he's talking about are both places and bases. And you know that force projection being a combat activity doesn't involve places, but will involve bases. So uh, I, we have our strong views on this, but since this question is not asked to me, but asked to you, uh, Michael, take it away. Well, I, it's interesting. China seems to have be talking more about uh, uh, strong points, establishment of uh, 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 strong point places, which are more along the lines of uh, uh, of potentially. Uh, uh, Cameron, uh, Tuda, uh, uh, potentially uh, Gwadar, potentially uh, uh, in uh, East Africa, uh, as opposed to a full up uh, 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 base uh, like we see in Djibouti. Now that doesn't mean that they won't do that, but I think the more important thing as far as what China's concerning, uh, seems to be concerned now is, is having having assured access to facilities that are essentially under the control of Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises. If it, they've either built them uh, or, and or manage them uh, so that they can be sure that they're going to have uh, access for fuel and food and, and those sorts of things, as opposed to a, a more elaborate facility with PLA Marines or soldiers uh, garrisoning uh, a compound and what have you. That seems to be where they're going right now. So thanks very much. And as you can see, the clock is uh, relentless in its movement and I'm trying very hard to plead with the uh, organizers, but until they respond, let me go to the next question. And uh, that is really uh, a question from Abhijit. And I want to answer that uh, simply because I cannot imagine that this is an answerable question. He just asks, uh, Abhijit uh, asks always difficult questions. And he says that the panel discusses the strategic aspects of the PLA naval uh, modernization and its presence, and have discussed how other nations in India could or will respond. Uh, partnerships have mostly been seen from a strategic perspective and we all know that the final decision in this regard is taken by the political leadership. And so can you tell us how the political command would be viewing the military command's assessment? And by the, by the, if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the audience here, uh, Abhijit, and count the number of political uh, participants, then the answer will uh, probably be depressing, but uh, factual. So nobody can actually answer this, uh, not in the panel. So I will beg your indulgence to proceed to the next question. And that is, where does mind warfare feature in all this expansion? And there's no mention of this immensely potential form of warfare. And talking about India, he says that we missed the bus on this front earlier. And do we have uh, plans of a technological graph? And the short answer to that, uh, if I might, uh, since this is an Indian uh, uh, specific question and addressed to me, is the short answer is yes, we do. And we're looking at... Uh, uh, a range of out-of-the-box uh, solutions ranging from the somewhat out-of-the-box uh, issues such as airborne um, laser-based um, mine detection systems uh, across to lighter-than-air craft being utilized, uh, of course, in uh, without prejudice to the fact that we are also simultaneously looking to accelerate not only mine sweepers and mine hunters or mine countermeasure vessels, but also utilizing vessels taken up from trade to undertake uh, missions such as this, using uh, our, our um, uh, leveraging our, um, our cooperative agreements with countries such as Australia. Uh, so there's one question that is uh, from the YouTube channel, and I think we will stop at that one. And that is whether the claims of building the largest naval fleet at a time when low intensity, high impact conflict models in land and air uh, are in mode uh, is in fact economically or operationally viable. And his uh, question is from, from uh, Dr. Ramesh is uh, that he thinks that it isn't viable so, Colin, 
Why don't you take a stab at that? Great. Um, well, I think we generally, most militaries, you talk about the services involved, the armies, air forces, and navies in today's context in the future are trying to fight for relevance. And in particular, I think it, is, it goes without saying that we have been seeing increasingly more prominent maritime security challenges that is popping up across the region and worldwide. So that does provide the reason for navies and for the matter, you know, Coast Guard to be continued to be invested upon. And I, I don't agree that, you know, just because, you know, land and, you know, or, you know, I would say, you know, when low intensity um, issues were more prominent, thereby you do not really need naval fleets. But I think generally, most of you will agree that navies are by nature multifunctional in nature. They could actually perform a whole range of missions from low intensity to high intensity. And you talk about, for example, disaster relief, very often navies, militaries in general, serve as first responders, right? And, you know, very much the case that, you know, even militaries are contributing in, in trying to be relevant, you know, in most other cases, including you know, in the current COVID-19 situation, where, you know, for example, in Southeast Asia, some of the navies are contributing by ferrying vaccines to the remote regions, because simply it is not very easy to mobilize civilian shipping for that purpose, right? So I will agree that, you know, because of the fact that low intensity security threats are more prominent, thereby we don't need to build out the Navy. In contrary, I think there is a greater need for that to happen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And I do want to say that, Michael, do you, do you want to put in a word? I just wanted to say, remember, world-class military is in the eye of the beholder. Xi Jinping did not define exactly how big that uh, that would be. And so tomorrow we could wake up and say, we've got it. We're world class. End of the story. So there's no guarantee that it's going to be bigger. I happen to think it will. But it, there's no guarantee that depending upon how China's economy turns or when uh, amongst the Central Military Commission, the Army and the Air Force says, how much is enough? Uh, and so uh, it, it so those are all very we, we that's why you can't predict the future. Quite right. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, we will, on that uh, note, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you en passant uh, to Darshana because she's a very busy person and had to go for another engagement, which is back to back and didn't factor uh, my somewhat uh, lackadaisical ability to, uh, to keep to the time. So uh, I, I'm sure you will all join me in saying thank you to her and equally in saying thank you to our stellar panel of uh, Admiral McDevitt and uh, uh, Dr. Colin Coe and uh, Captain Agni Hotri. I want to end with one last comment because I did have two minutes that I sacrificed, so I'll take 30 seconds off that. And that is that when we're talking about sea denial capacities or capabilities of the PLA Navy in the North Indian Ocean, I think that we are actually talking about the sea denial element within sea control because China for sure needs a moving area of sea control because you know, something like 74% uh, of Chinese oil, crude oil is still coming from that very area. So they cannot afford to have a classic case of sea denial when they don't want to use the area, but they just don't want anybody else to use it. So it's the sea denial element within sea control. And if we remember that, then Chinese vulnerability is actually multiplied. So uh, I just need to uh, say thank you once again to all our panelists. I hope that you will, in the virtual fashion that you are, be clapping like hell. I know that each of them deserves a thunderous round of, of applause. And uh, I will just uh, ask you to settle, gentlemen, and uh, for two small ones clapping like hell. So thank you once, once again. Thank you, ICS. Thank you, Ambassador Shokan. Thank you, uh, Colonel Venkat. And uh, thank you, uh, Shruti and everybody else. Have a great evening. It's been a wonderful, marvelous way to um, wend our way in India to the bar and uh, for those like Admiral McDevitt to wend their way to pancakes or whatever. So <laughs> all the very best.